Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the University of Dundee, the next in our series of public events for the Black History Month, uh, today discussing decolonizing education. Uh, I'm pleased to be the facilitator for this public academic conversation between Professor Fiona Kumari Campbell and Dr. Fernando Lenez Fernandez on the important and relevant topic of decolonizing education. First, a little background for the conversation. This is a component of the broader view of the UK Black History Month and will cover elements that are relevant to many cultures and indigenous peoples. I am Dr. Richard Parsons, the university librarian. I'm a long-standing member and current member of the University Equality and Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And I'm pleased that the university is hosting the event and a number of others this month. The specific matter of addressing, of appropriately addressing decolonizing education is a component of our activity for the equality, the race equality charter. And while we're not creating a university position today, it's an important element of that conversation and developing a position in due course. As my role as librarian and director, uh, I I'm responsible for a group that manages the purchase of many learning resources, and we have responsibility for the university archives and records management. Now, it's clearly appropriate that those of us with these custodial responsibilities appreciate that a balance, different political viewpoints are represented, expression of academic freedom are all present in the domains that we purchase and license. They underpin much of the learning and teaching within higher education, and these resources need to be fair and re reasonable and represent not just the traditional histories. Diversity is required. Our work in the EDI committee is to ensure the university community understands different personal perspectives that people have. So for me, that comes from growing up in a multiracial society in New Zealand with a very gentle immigration to Australia and then to Scotland. We each have our own personal journey and perspective, and I hope I'm learning to respect that of others. In decolonizing education, our conversationalists are Dr. Fernando Fernandez, a reader in the School of Education and Social Work with biracial origins and experience in Brazil and the UK. Professor Fiona Kumari Campbell is currently the Professor of Disability and Ableness Studies also in the School of Education and Social Work with biracial origins and experience in Sri Lanka, New Zealand, Australia and the UK. They will lead us in a conversation for about 50 minutes and have invited questions and discussion for a further 25 to 30 minutes. The session is being recorded and we aim to make it available for others to view as soon as possible. For the audience, please prepare and submit those questions using the question and answer icon that you'll find on the top right of the screen. And colleagues behind the scenes will manage the collation and grouping of these questions. And we may need to answer some of them offline, but our speakers are flexible and, and adaptable to the approach. We'll deal with the question and discussion after the initial conversation. And briefly before 3.30, I will summarize and close the presentation. We're very interested in the next stages of this work, but first the conversation. So over to Fiona and Fernando. Thanks, Richard. Uh, welcome everybody. And it's such a thrill to be in conversation with Fernando, uh, a colleague, and I will say a dear friend as well. So we've had many of these conversations before and uh, we hope to extend them. So we're going to just firstly start off with uh, the first question, just to tell you a little bit about ourselves, um, our background and our interest in this topic. So uh, in my own situation, um, you can probably tell from my name that something's going on there, Scottish name, and then there's a Sri Lankan name in the middle, Kumari. Um, so my background is I'm pretty much, I would describe myself as a product of empire, of colonial relations. Uh, my mother is Sri Lankan and my father is Scottish and they met in Australia under the £10 POM scheme. I'm sure that's not its official title, but they emigrated to um, Australia um, in the aftermath of the Second World War and um, decolonisation as well. Um, so I'm a product of that, but my histories go further back than that. My, my Sri Lankan family um, actually 
uh, originate from the Iberian Peninsula. They escaped persecution um, in the uh, uh, 15, 1600s and then went to the Dutch colonies and then Sri Lanka was a Dutch colony um, at the time. And uh, so I, I identify as biracial. I've been called other things. In fact, uh, uh, when I was growing up under the White Australia policy, so the first nine years of my life, I was uh, often called in the playground a, a mongrel bastard, um, a nearly white person. Um, and I had to work through processes of shame um, around colour. And in fact, colour has coloured my life, so to speak, in the sense that, uh, you know, I'm often referred to as a white Sri Lankan or the whitest in the family. So I've had to deal with uh, racial and cultural hierarchies here. And I've been working in the area of decolonizing research in particular and working with uh, peripheral peoples uh, around the globe. Over to you, Fernando. Thank you very much, Fiona, and thank you everyone for organizing these events. Thank you to the University of Dundee for the opportunity to talk about this relevant issue uh, with our colleagues and outside university as well. So I'm Fernando. Uh, I'm Brazilian, but also from Indian background. My father was Indian. Uh, and there's a lot, if you want to talk about the full name and the surnames, etc. Uh, that's a lot to, that tells about ourselves when we speak about the full name. My, my middle name is Lannis. And Lannis tells a lot about the story of my family because Lannis com comes from a French background. Uh, but if you look back in my, my ancestors, we had the black people and people who even were slaves uh, two or three or, three or four generations back. Uh, that's an interesting point about the, the way race is perceived in my country in Brazil, when the color of your skin tells a lot about who you are. And the, my family historically tried to whiten themselves. So, uh, of course, the, the Scottish weather doesn't help very much for my color skin. I tend to be a bit more brown. But uh, even though my grandmother possibly she would be very proud of my whiteness as it is now, because as many Brazilian uh, uh, mixed black people, there's also a sort of a racism, you know, in terms of people who want to deny their origins and their color uh, in opposition to people who really want to reaffirm their color and their origins as the black movement and so on. So I think that's important to be said. I was working with human rights and social movements. Uh, it started you know, when I was only 14, when I joined a political party the, as part of the students' movements in Brazil. But later I, I helped to create an organization in Brazilian favelas, Observatory of Favelas, when we worked very much with you know, human rights, police uh, abuse and violence, etc. And it's always been against black people and, and people from peripheral backgrounds in the urban neighborhoods in Brazil. Uh, once uh, I was in Brazil, uh, I always realized that uh, although, despite of my, my background, my family background, etc., I am a privileged person in my country because essentially, uh, although in the UK I can be a kind of a mixed uh, background or, or BME, uh, in Brazil I am essentially a white person uh, for our cultural context. And uh, uh, I know my origin and I know who I am. But when I was in the UK first time, I realized how important it is to look back and understand you know, the force of these representations, especially when you feel yourself not belonging to a place. And I think that tells a lot about my, my personal story, uh, in despite of the fact I have a, a PhD and you know, uh, a university degree, uh, I always suffered some sort of discrimination prejudice uh, in several experiences in life. So I think that tells a lot about uh, uh, this sort of experience. So I, I'm really uh, uh, looking forward for the conversation. Uh, as Fiona said, we have a friendship uh, beyond the, the working relationship. And I think uh, we have a lot to talk today. Uh, up to you, Fiona, please. OK, thank you, Fernando. That's great. So the first question which I'll talk to is, um, so we've got basically three sub questions, but the first question I'll talk to is what does decolonization mean to, to each of us? So um, I might just start here and again, just containing the discussion. So decolonization is a word that's kind of bandied around. It means different things to different people. And I think because of that, you know, people can be empathetic towards the idea of decolonization or they can be uh, frightened or in fact opposed 
the idea of decolonization in education. So for me, I, I um, decolonization very much involves what I call a rebalancing of current approaches to how knowledge is formed and practices of self. Um, and so and decolonizing is not a one off act. It's a it's a process. It's a process where different worldviews, particularly the worldviews of people who've suffered a long history um, of oppression and marginalization are actually given space to communicate from from their frame of reference. And that's why it's a rebalance. So decolonizing the education is based on this idea. In fact, actually, there is a a asymmetrical a form of um, of, of power. So uh, and that's uh, that's really important. Um, mindful of this, however, there I think we need to decolonizing uh, knowledge and decolonizing conversations need to critique the idea of what sometimes some people call the oppression Olympics or hierarchies of suffering. Um, and in many ways, this kind of hierarchy has been established by the neoliberal system that actually in order to get rights within neoliberal legal systems, you have to firstly show you've suffered. I mean, there's only way, only that's the basis. That's the trope for um, accessing uh, human rights. And uh, that often then results in some sort of ranking system. Uh, I've, I get very suspicious of that because I think that the whole kind of oppression Olympics or hierarchies of suffering actually is a divide and rule strategy. Uh, so we need to to, to look at that. Um, I think identity is important and, and uh, that's quite distinct as Fernando has already raised in telling his story. I, the idea of identity is something that's quite different from this notion of identity politics. I'm actually quite a critic of identity politics, but uh, clearly my personal history of my ancestors, uh, my current and future realities are very much um, important to my sense of identity. I just want to say a couple of few, couple more things before handing over to, to Fernando. So if we're talking about decolonizing education or decolonizing conversations, we need to explore very challenging and vexed questions and particularly the question of cultural relativism. For example, are all cultures equal? Do, should they all be considered of, of vital importance? Should we, for example, tolerate the intolerable? Uh, you know, all cultures and empires and traditions have a share of both good and bad uh, knowledges, practices and traditions. And I actually think we need to sift through that uh, to ensure we don't have a one sided amplification of those knowledges and suddenly say, well, look, oh, gee, the West is bad and um, uh, the global South um, is good. I think that's a, a very uh, uh, immature and, and, and wrong process. We need to um, tackle the good with bad. The other thing is we need to move away from this idea that when we're talking about decolonization, um, that we see it as a binary relation. What do I mean? That it's a question of uh, black and white or east and west. In fact, actually, I think we need to look at intra-colonialism. For example, intra is within countries or within regions, there are forms of colonialism and uh, segregation and discrimination and indeed violence based on class, caste, uh, regionalism, religion, ethnicity, sex and elite patronage systems. So decolonization needs to be uh, vertical as as well as uh, as well as horizontal. So it's not a black on white issue. Uh, and we need to be aware of this. There is currently uh, an emerging trend. Angela Saini talks about this, a group called racial realists, um, which is, by the way, the modern fangled word for racist, um, who are often supporting academic journals with a view to supporting intelligence studies based on DNA research um, uh, mixed associated with uh, racialized and nationalized agendas. So you find, for example, that a lot of these uh, intelligence scientists come from countries in the Middle East, in China, um, in India. Mm. Um, so finally, just to just say so also is that this, this conversation needs to open up space to acknowledge that there are different insights and different perceptions about um, what happens in uh, people's lives and in researchers' lives. And I just wanted to point out two things that are useful for you. Uh, the American anthropologist Bambi Chapin, um, C-A-P-I-N, uh, she's done some great research about being an American anthropologist in Sri Lanka and the kinds of mistakes that she made in her research, which is great to acknowledge, but things that she noticed and things that she didn't notice. Um, 
the recent um, refugee who got political asylum in New Zealand, Baruz Bachani, who's a, a Kurdish refugee who was on Manus Island as part of Australia's um, offshore immigration policy, notes the fact that, you know, in often an activist discourse, there there is a critique of refugees being sent to Manus Island, which is part of Papua New Guinea, right? Um, uh, but it, it, the narrative is that these refugees have been sent to this empty space, but as he acknowledges, there's a colonial, colonial narrative there because actually Manus Island off Papua New Guinea is not an empty space. There are 45,000 Indigenous people living there with a distinct culture and history. So, Fernando, what does uh, decolonisation mean to you? Uh, thank you, Fiona. Uh, I would say in first place that decolonisation is a very complex process that occurs in different scales, times and spaces. So some people can even claim that you know, Scotland has been colonized by England and by the empire. Uh, so we need to look at colonization on different scales and I think that is very important. Also because uh, when you talk about uh, North and uh, South, uh, sometimes we forget that there are Souths inside the North and Norths inside the South and vice versa. So we have different uh, arrangements for colonialism. And colonialism, it's about imposition of certain worldviews and ways of doing and thinking that have uh, the, 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 the ultimate objective to extract something from someone. And that's made through dehumanization, monsterization, and all sorts of uh, mechanisms of oppression and uh, social domination. Uh, it's important to say that because uh, the colonial process, the modern colonial process that occurred uh, in the 15th century, basically created what uh, the Portuguese uh, professor Boaventura Souza Santos calls an abyssal line between you know, this kind of global north thinking and global south thinking, of course, much more complex as said. But this abyssal line, it's very important to be considered because that creates some sort of mental barriers that prevents us even to acknowledge the potency and the relevance you know, of the knowledge and practice coming from different mindsets, from different cultural perspectives. And I think that's a very important point when we talk about decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing education universities, because uh, we live in a world where certain countries, certain cultures and certain institutions, as is the case of global universities like Dundee and many others across the UK and the US and Australia, etc. They are big players in the production of knowledge. So it, it implies a big responsibility for these institutions to rethink the way they, they act, the way they are present, you know, in this global geopolitics of uh, knowledge production. So decolonization it, uh, has to consider these and you need to look at this from his historical perspective. Yeah, I, wanted to I was just say, Fernando, I wanted to follow up something with you there because uh, you know, you've talked about like the relations of, of, of research production. I mean, there are, uh, you know, uh, even getting, for example, uh, Global South writers getting published. But, um, you know, the importance, uh, I mean, Santos, whose work but that you and I both use, I mean, he talks about, you know, ep 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 uh, social justice can't happen without first having epistemic justice. In other words, justice around knowledge. And um, I think, uh, you know, what's really important, we talked about uh, people getting distorted ideas. They're only getting, um, you know, particular forms of knowledge drawn from, uh, you know, Global North traditions. I mean, my own work, for example, I've just like the last five years been looking at um, different Indian traditions in public reason. Uh, the fact that, for example, which might surprise our audience, that uh, there is a tradition that you can you can run four arguments, sorry, not four, seven arguments um, at the same time. There is this idea that you can have multiple truths. Um, there is a particular form of um, Indian argumentation which uh, would really uh, uh, supplement the work and in fact strengthen the work of um, evidence-based researchers. Uh, there are difficult, different um, ethic, ethical traditions um, of, around uh, humanisation. So I think uh, it's about kind of, as you say, exposing uh, uh, people to these knowledges, but also supporting uh, greater opportunity of access in the global system. 
Absolutely, Fiona. And one thing else uh, that I forgot to say is that uh, uh, we need to look at what the Boaventura calls uh, ecology of knowledge, and knowledge with an S at the end and a plural, just to emphasize the relevance of multiple and diverse knowledge production. Uh, because it, unless we create a system where a different sort of knowledge are accommodated, it's very difficult to think about decolonizing academic or any sort of a, uh, uh, knowledge production. And one important thing as well as part of this, as you said very well, is that uh, we need to create systems where people can coexist, people and systems uh, can coexist, because what we see nowadays, uh, it's a tendency to accommodate diversity in bubbles or in kind of boxes. So we welcome diversity, welcome uh, uh, different people, so long you keep yourself in your boxes. But what we actually need, it's a system where these bubbles, they break up and people really coexist in a, in a, in a, in a more harmonic way. Uh, that's not easy, uh, it sounds naive, but that's the only way out uh, to overcome many of the issues that we face uh, in our society. Yeah, you, you, you raise a really great point and I certainly don't want to be buried in a uh, diversity uh, silo box, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, if anything, then for some of us, we have to worry about which box um, uh, we, we get buried in. I mean, uh, but but beside that, that humour, uh, I think the other issue, and I'm thinking about the, the critics of decolonisation uh, might raise is, um, a critique of the idea of lived experience. And um, I think, you know, I just wanted to address that and get your views on this too, uh, Fernando. I mean, I think lived experience is really important. It's, it's materialist, it's grounded, it's embodied. But I think when we talk about the primacy of lived experience, um, firstly, I don't think it's it should be a primacy, but it's an orientation. But lived experience uh, also needs to be critiqued because, you know, as Joan Scott says um, in her work, that no experience is pre-theoretical. In other words, we use theoretical frameworks uh, to make sense of our experiences, to to narrate them. Um, and uh, so we need we need to look at that because, uh, you know, and that's where theorising is really important, but um, any kind of uh, knowledge formation or theoretical development has to be um, grounded in and make sense to the, uh, the, the, the experiences of people. Um, I think it's really important to experience, uh, to listen to the voices of, of peripheral and marginalised people because, um, we all get an insight into the variations in um, in, in the human condition, uh, but also insights into viewing the world and how we use our bodies, how we use our appropriate proprioceptive, that's a hard word, senses, things like smell, touch, taste, uh, um, are also culturally um, attuned as well. So I th think lived experience is important, but it must be critiqued and theorised. What do you think, Fernando? I agree, Fiona, and also considering the, the, the way we accommodate the difference, because for, I can give you some practical examples. Uh, I was doing uh, English classes in Brazil and my, my private teacher, she was Japanese. So basically she lived in London for a long time. Every time I was speaking, she was with a closed eye like that. And the, I, I couldn't realize what that means. You know, she's not paying attention to me, but in fact she was because that's the way uh, most Japanese people do when they are paying attention is closing the eyes uh, and concentrating what they are speaking. And sometimes we Latino people, for example, we like to embrace, to kiss and to talk to people, you know, and you are very uh, 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 elaborated with your arms, etc. Uh, and I can see myself in many occasions trying to contend myself to, to adapt and to adjust, you know, to certain cultural environments when I think this is not right. So uh, that's the point when uh, even when you have, a, you know, uh, a lot of credentials or economic and cultural capitals, if you live abroad, uh, you are always the other who needs to adjust and while the, the, the only who hosts you always puts you in a kind of a hostage situation where you need to adjust and adapt all the time uh, that you are there. 
Yeah, to totally get you, Fernando. I mean, I've certainly, you know, I've got a strong Australian accent, which is not too great. But anyway, uh, I've been like people have said to me, I've only been in Scotland since 2017. And, you know, some people have said to me, oh, look, Fiona, you come across too blunt. But I think Australians are quite direct. And, um, you know, I don't want to bad mouth Australians, but I think we're probably known to be using bad language sometimes, a little bit more colloquial. So I think uh, the, the process of cultural translation and how we communicate um, with body and, and voice are really important. Um, I want to move on to the next focus, Fernando, about how we might decolonise um, education, learning and research. So I might go to you first and then I'll come back and uh, revisit my notes. OK, Fiona, perfect. Uh, thank you. I think there is a problem with the term decolonizing when you think about uh, global north institutions, the dominant institutions. I'm saying that because fundamentally uh, British institutions, as the case of many other European institutions, they were, uh, they were colonizers and possibly they are still colonizers in many ways so because they are dominant institutions so decolonize also means putting in question this kind of a colonizer viewpoint uh, which has a lot to do with the way institutions and peoples and mindsets are formed and shaped so that's a very important point uh, to look at this and for example, I told you before that I joined a, a political party when I was 14, and that was very important for my intellectual and political formation. But after a while, and that was a left party, after a while, you know, when it starts to become a, a bit smarter, let's say, I realized how limited, for example, certain political and theoretical narratives like the Marxist structuralist narratives are limited to understand the struggles that we're going through, for example, in indigenous communities in Brazil. So it's very important to, to, to look at this from indigenous perspectives, and sometimes we just adopt a, a, a westernized a theoretical approach without you know, considering the difference that it should accommodate. Another point that I want to make is the fact that uh, the university do represent a power globally, and the, uh, they are institutions producing knowledge and qualifying people, you know, who are going to work in their home countries, etc. So basically, these dominant institutions, they are shaping dominant voice and dominant uh, mindsets. This is very important because it gives us a lot of responsibility in what you are delivering back, you know, to people going back to their countries. Uh, I'm saying that because uh, one can argue that, oh, some people, they come from countries who are not democratic countries and they're coming to a free country to learn new things and they go back home. Uh, the equation is not that simple. And I think we need to reflect about that. Uh, but also we need to consider uh, the risk of uh, exercising new sorts of colonization and colonialism. For example, when we have this market-oriented approach uh, in many universities, when you go to colonized countries and you know, attract uh, students, getting their fees, and then send them back home. So uh, this should be done uh, more critically. And sometimes uh, the, the market agenda tends to become very dominant and it becomes a big problem when you talk about decolonizing universities. And finally, uh, a very important point is the fact that universities are public goods, no matter if they are fully private uh, uh, institutions or if they are publicly funded, but they are uh, uh, public institutions that has a role uh, uh, in society. And I think it has a lot to do with the way we engage with our research, with our scholarship, and how we are converting what to do in these institutions to the society, to change society and to address fundamental issues for human dignity across the world. Up to you, Fiona. Thanks, Fernando. I mean, you know what's really great about this exercise is, uh, and you know, just for the audience, we, we, we wanted to make this an organic conversation, and it is, but obviously we had to prepare, so we kind of exchanged notes. And what's really great about this is, uh, you know, we've, we've said similar things, but we've also like kind of focused on different different dimensions. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's really important. And I think you've particularly focused on um, the role of the university as an institution, and um, and I totally agree with what you've said. And uh, but I, my focus has been a bit different. So I, when I was thinking about this question long and hard, as you do, um, I did group my response under a number of categories, and I'm going to just talk about those. So I looked at the role of critique, 
I looked at the importance of um, discovery, uh, the role of comparison, comparative research and comparative thinking and uh, hegemonic realignment and issues to do with legacy. So I'm just going to kind of go through that a bit. The first thing I want to say, and I, this is such a rare statement because I'm usually not uh, a person who's dogmatic, but I will start off with this, but then I'll explain it. Uh, you know, the question about whether we should decolonize or not as a question is non-negotiable. And I would very rarely say anything is non-negotiable. Uh, but uh, why do I say it's non-negotiable? Richard pointed this out at the start. This is part of a bigger agenda. It's about the race charter. It's about section 12.6 of the university's action plan. And I know you're all going to go running to that 12.6. Um, but I think the important thing is decolonization um, as a conversation doesn't stand alone. And so when I say it's non-negotiable, I'm not saying that in the sense of some sort of kind of like boot stomping dogmatism. Uh, it has to occur alongside the celebration and commitment to viewpoint diversity, uh, which is really important, academic freedom, and also a commitment to having uncomfortable conversations. Um, I actually think ambivalence and being uncomfortable are really important places to be. They can provide, yes, headache, yes, grief, struggle, but hopefully they can, uncomfortableness can result in insight. So um, we need to look at, so when we're talking about this decolonizing, we need to discern what is being asked and then how do we respond to it? So these are my thoughts. I just wanted to go through these briefly and I said I could go on for hours, but I'm not. Um, I think we have to look at the idea of critique. What do I mean by that? Uh, when we're talking about knowledge and decolonization, we need to look and examine uh, and interrogate systems that discriminate, whether that be in the East and the West, North and South. Uh, for example, the Indian caste system, which I've written about, texts of terror in Islam, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, in Judaism, in Christianity. I was watching a documentary the other day and it asked the question, why is it that women, it's women that starve, starve in South Sudan? We need to look at these questions. So these, um, we need to rethink the kind of questions that we ask, you know, uh, such as how people who share a, co a colonised heritage um, can be seen as contributors to the UK rather than mere beneficiaries of white benevolence. Uh, we, for, for people who are, are sensibly of a, a white heritage background, there might be a different question, for example. How can you draw upon histories that have been largely lost to you that you're unaware of? And, you know, there's been some great debates already starting in the UK about the slavery, history of slavery. Um, but also not just a persecution. There are histories, for example, of British working class dissidents uh, have worked closely and learnt from anti-colonial resistors. So there's kind of a really interesting thing. We've got the, the British working class dissidents actually uh, taking the knowledge, taking the advice, remember pre-internet days, of course, um, from uh, activists uh, in, and colonial resistors, in, particularly in the, in the subcontinent. So there's kind of like a reverse uh, mentoring uh, happening here. Um, so in terms of discovery, I think it's not just a case, and this is where the dangers, and this is where sometimes you've seen, I guess, again, a bastardization of decolonial colonialism. See, I told you I was Australian using such dreadful words. Uh, but, uh, and so it's kind of the chucking the baby out with the bathwater, out with the old and in with the new. This is not what I understand decolonizing education to be. Uh, actually, I think we need to reinsert the Western canon into the curriculum. That might be quite shocking for some of you. What's she saying? I actually think we need to study more of John Locke and Jacques Rousseau and uh, David Hume, Cicero and Pluto. Why? Because they were writing about the human condition. Unfortunately, in many countries, like, like in Australia, uh, the classics and knowledge of these amazing writers, yes, they were white, able-bodied men in, in the main, but they had some great insights to say about uh, the human condition. I know Cicero, for example, has written about aging, really fascinating stuff. But we also need to include the canons of Confucianism. And I do teach uh, Confucianist uh, thought in my teaching, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism about equalities and humanness. So that's again why I use that phrase rebalancing um, about different perspectives, different canons, and also outliers like aberrant kind of knowledges. So 
decolonization for me is about really rethinking about our relationship to history um, and uh, and the imperial legacies and how imperial legacies um, shape ourselves and how they've shaped our society. Uh, you can't go back, but also how imperial legacies shape our relationship with each other. A couple of other points, and uh, Fernando's heard this before because I often keep banging on about this sort of stuff because I'm a bit of a, a methodology junkie when it comes to research and getting good rigorous research. Um, so I, um, I'm really interested in this idea of comparison and particularly, I guess, for the researchers, but this applies to our teaching as well. How do we theorise comparison? You know, are we comparing apples and oranges? How do we contrast? Um, so it, uh, comparison is always about a relationship, right? So I think, uh, and I'm happy if people want to contact me later, I can give you a, a, some, some references to that. Uh, but I think that's really important, the comparison, comparative thought. What systematic, systematic rules are we using, case-based reasoning, debate and dialogue? I think actually we need to resurrect the art of dialogue and debate. Um, in terms of he hegemonic realignment, and that's a challenge. And Fernando, you've already talked about this, and we're influenced by different folk. But um, I'm influenced by the Malaysian sociologist uh, Alatas, and uh, there's, there's there's two of them, there's a father and son team, and they came up with the notion of what's called the captive mind. Um, it's really hard just to say, oh, let's go and consult somebody in the global south, you know, maybe India, um, Sri Lanka, and get their perspective, because what you'll find actually is that uh, depending on people's age and where they've undertaken their education. They've also been schooled in um, what Chakrabarti calls provincializing Europe, in other words, the Western tradition. And in fact, actually, they're often better at it than us uh, in, in terms of understanding um, Western scholasticism. Um, so we do need to um, look at look to new perspectives and and that's that rebalancing and i've already pointed this out before there's some brilliant stuff seriously i could get hooked and addicted to this new forms of and methods of argumentation and in indian philosophy different kinds of proofs uh, case-based reasoning which is great for legal studies um and alternative ethical systems about justice. And let me just give you one because, hey, this is a great propaganda moment. For example, in Confucianism, the definition of social justice is um, is harmony. It's quite a different concept to social justice, for, for example, uh, the different, different and varied um, uh, ethical traditions. And finally, before I'm... Um, pick up another issue with Fernando. I do want to raise this issue because some people will say, look, the past is past, let's move on. Uh, maybe people are kind of making out too much of their, their background or they're stuck in the victim status and all this sort of thing. I do think we need to look at legacies and I think it's a really important issue. I mean, I'm a BAME person and I'm biracial. I have a disability. This is not just me saying I am, I am in terms of identity politics. These experiences through the generations. I'm 57, so, you know, these kind of legacies, uh, uh, they shape and form you. I I, I, write, I I mentioned the fact that, um, you know, the nine years of my life were under the white Australia policy. That shaped and formed me. So we need to look at legacies of humiliation and what has been the accumulated effect of subordinations. And I note that Deuce has got a, a lovely speaker um, speaking in a, a, a couple of weeks, I can't remember the date, where, you know, it's not just a case of inserting a person of colour into the university. What, it, what are the legacies that they bring with them of those asymmetrical power relations? Um, so I'm just looking at the clock here, Fernando, where we, we could chat about this for hours. So maybe we need to look at some of the challenges. What do you think some of the challenges are in um, engaging in decolonization? OK, uh, I, I just need to, to comment on something that you said for me is very important. You said about the rigor in research, which I agree. But the rigor also takes me to think about certain words that have been used systematically uh, by us, you know, in the university system, especially in the global north, and they are quite ideological. I'm talking about uh, the ideas of world class research and excellence, because what defines excellence and what defines a world class institution? I'm saying that because in my country, for example, we have excellent universities and research being done, but we don't have the same recognition that universities in Europe receive. And in many ways, it's because the, the criteria and the, the assessment systems are set up by the dominant institutions. So we need to reflect critically about that, because in many ways, 
we are a, uh, basically reproduce, you know, a new form of colonialism uh, using this kind of few wording. Uh, I, I remember I had debates with a colleague a, a few weeks ago about, you know, uh, research being named the work, word class. And I said, I would never use these words for my research, even if that is recognized internationally, because I think that's so arrogant uh, to use these. And I think we need to be very careful about that as well. Can I just so, jump in before you move on just to respond okay. to that really quickly? Here's the organic bit. Um, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, the way the kind of rankings of universities, you know, the US will, will always be at the top. And um, I think we, rigor is important, but it's about the kind of the nuts and bolts of what is uh, what are recognised research approaches. And again, decolonising also means decolonising the actual research process itself and uh, systems of for recognition. Uh, but over to you. OK, thank you. Yeah, so uh, in terms of the, the last question, which is uh, what are the challenges of engaging decolonization? Uh, I think the first thing we need to consider is decolonizing our cognitive structures because you have so many rooted, you know, uh, ideas and mindsets that it's very difficult to create what Boaventura called they think or uh, 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 despensar, as you say in Portuguese. So uh, I think it's important because uh, in many cases, we're talking here about uh, what has been coined as white privilege. So we are talking about dominant institutions where white privilege is a dominant mindset as well. So this has to be challenged in many ways. And for me, the only way to achieve that, or at least a very important way to achieve that is through a pedagogy of coexistence. And again, referring to my colleague, Jailson Silva in Brazil, who believes that we need to live diversity in coexistence. We cannot live diversity in bubbles. And that's part of a major institutional change. And institutions are made by people, and people can change institutions because fundamentally uh, there is no uh, uh, way to, to say this is God's creation, this is human creation, and so we have the power to change these things. So another thing that is important for me in terms of challenge, if you really want to decolonize university, we also need to think about the staff diversity. I think that University of Dundee is trying to do well in terms of staff diversity, but I think we, start, we are still very far away, you know, from the, the, the ideal. Uh, so I think our managers need to think about how we can diversify our staff as well, not only in terms of you know, international staff, and not talking about the European international staff, but people coming from different countries outside the Europe, US and Australia, but also in terms of gender balance as well. Uh, finally, we need to think about the internationalization from a much more philosophical and perhaps altruistic perspective rather than just market oriented. Unfortunately, internationalization became a very strong market uh, strategy across you know, many British and American universities in terms of attracting students, attracting research partnerships, etc. Uh, so I think we need to reclaim internationalization from a different angle, from a different perspective. Uh, I do have some, some concerns when people think that decolonizing curriculum, for example, is just a matter of uh, diversifying the authors. Uh, and I agree with Fiona that uh, we need to really evaluate the classical readers, you know, uh, even these white uh, classical uh, writers and theoreticals uh, from the European past, because it's all about the ecology of knowledge, is how we can accommodate different formations, knowledge formations, but not only the academic ones, I mean, people producing academic knowledge in India and Brazil and so on, but also popular and peripheral uh, uh, knowledge productions that uh, not always are produced you know, in the university or in the academic environment. So that's very important. There's a lot of knowledge to be explored and to be uh, uh, together with us. So basically decolonization can end up becoming a kind of a buzzword and I think that's a big risk that you are facing. Uh, I think we need to look at some kind of concrete ideas because my great concern is we go offline here after this uh, conversation and then everyone goes home, do their things and forget about decolonizing. So decolonizing has to be embedded in our everyday practice and that's very difficult to do. When I said about uh, decolonizing our uh, cognitive structures, it's all about that because we have already our way of doing things and that has to be changed. So I think, first of all, I have three 
very concrete suggestions that I want to make here. The first one, we do need to have a safe space to talk about racism and white privilege at university. So we need to have a space where people can express their concerns and realize uh, the white prejudice that they carry with them. Uh, there's a, a, a theoretical person, uh, it's uh, Peggy McIntosh, and she says that the white prejudice is uh, white privilege is something like a backpack, and you have a lot of you know privilege in your back, and then you just use them in your benefits. And sometimes it's uh, 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 privileged people they just ignore the fact that they are privileged. The system is creating on that privilege to sustain this privilege and that has to be challenged in any way. So we need to create this safe space to talk about racism and white privilege. The other thing is that uh, decolonization should be part of not, not only of the curriculum change, but also institutional structural change in the university and beyond. And I know that colleagues are working around that and I think that's very important, but uh, perhaps we should think about create a decolonizing commission or something that can push this agenda forward uh, more concretely. And finally, uh, we need to create uh, programs that can challenge hegemonic epistemologies, and I think one way of doing that is having more university outreach programs. I know that many colleagues are doing works here and there, but we don't have actually a university program that can bring together these different experiences when uh, peripheral knowledge and community knowledge come together with the academic knowledge. So I think we need to create this kind of a, uh, a space and we should have a sort of a university community engagement a unity or, or even a kind of knowledge hub. Uh, I had a, a small project in the past that was the shared knowledge hub that worked very well, bringing people from different backgrounds. I think we need to think about, you know, some sort of a concrete initiative to bring students, staff and communities together to reclaim, you know, diverse and uh, ecological ways of producing knowledge. Thanks, Fernando. Wow, that's uh, oh, and that's just uh, really inspiring. And I use that in a, a nice way. It's just such great concrete, uh, concrete kind of recommendations, but also observations about the challenges. Um, so I guess what I'm going to say just to wrap this up is to kind of uh, supplement what you've already been saying. Um, I think there are some challenges, and I think we need to own own them. And I talked about uncomfortable conversations before. Um, there, there is a resistance, uh, I think, from um, staff and maybe students, but I'm thinking about staff here, of, for people making themselves vulnerable to reflection and a preparedness to actually listen to perspectives and lived experiences that are different from one's own. Um, and, you know, maybe I might put my head on the plate here and say, I, I can understand that. I think there's been a degree of parochialism sometimes in Scotland and maybe in Dundee. See, there you go. My head is already on the plate uh, about that, but that's just been an observation. I think the automatic response when these issues are raised is to um, deflect, to interrogate, to disavow. Um, to say that racism is not real or that whiteness doesn't exist. So it's, there's been quite an antagonistic com combative response. I think that's unhelpful. I think it's about deep listening and I think that needs to be done. And again, that's the nature of uncomfortable conversations um, on both sides. So we can uh, not only just understand what people believe, but what has led them to have particular beliefs and, and, and reactions. So there is this pushback. Um, actually, there's a term for this. Sorry, I'm a researcher. Margaret Thornton, who's a legal theorist from Australia, uses the word homosociality, which is basically a fancy word for saying that often we're comfortable with our own kind. People who like, you know, know about football teams and, you know, do uh, maybe live in the same area. There's common reference points. You know, we have our own groups and that's and that's fine. Uh, people who are familiar, but that can then also lead to denials. Um, and there, we do need more debate and dialogue, and I've already said that. I think we are actually living in quite a chilly climate um, around academic freedom, uh, viewpoint diversity, even cancel culture, um, and there's an uncritical revisionism of history. And I think we need to, that's what I'm saying, these debates are part of a bigger um, uh, area of, of contention. And um, and. But I think on the other hand, also the demands for recognition can um, 
can lead to accelerate the antagonisms, actually almost widening that gap between us and them. And that's where, Fernando, I really love your pedagogy of coexistence. That should be our litmus test. Is does anything is anything that we do and say, does, is it leading to a real sense of coexistence or is it actually fueling the fire of antagonisms? As we see, for example, with some of the um, kind of extreme uh, identity politics. Uh, I think, you know, you can see this playing out in the, in, in the US. And um, two other final things to say before we move over to Richard. I thought we were actually going to have more time, but I think we'll be right, Richard. Um, I actually would like to come up with a really concrete suggestion. Um, I actually think that uh, as a signature experience of the University of Dundee, and I've not run this by anybody, uh, is I think there needs to be a module, a compulsory module that everybody does, irrespective of their, of their degree, about global knowledge systems of humanisation and dehumanisation. And, you know, that's relevant for people doing maths even, um, you know, sciences, uh, particularly with the kind of, uh, you know, as Angela Saini has suggested with the return of scientific racism. So I think everybody should do a core module. It's a signature experience of the university that looks at global knowledge systems that uh, either support increased humanization or as Fernando has said, coexistence, pedagogy of coexistence, or in fact are, are about dehumanization and objectifying people. So that's the first concrete suggestion. Um, What's going to happen after the day that links up, Fernando, with your, you know, I think important question. And those of us that have been in the game for long enough get very cynical and suspicious about these kind of um, initiatives because we've seen them come and go and nothing changes. Uh, so I think we need to explore beyond rhetoric um, or some kind of accusatory wokeness, you know, the ac making accusations and weaponizing you know, this idea of which which side of the fence are you on. I think we need to get away from that. But we do need to, however, look at the textures and characteristics of institutionalised um, racism, ableism and sexism. We need to, instead of saying, oh, look, there's no such thing, uh, we actually, again, need to engage in debate and dialogue about um, the different conceptual approaches to, to that institutionalisation. Because and finally, because I think the devil's in the detail. You you can have people, you can kind of ban or have you know equalities laws about prohibiting explicit forms of discrimination. But what you'll find, and certainly the conversations I've had with um, uh, black and brown folk at, 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 at Dundee and elsewhere, is often it's in the everyday interaction, in the subtleties. Um, of how decisions are made, and Fernando, you've pointed this out. Things like hiring practices, for example. Um, and when people do get hired, how do we actually enable those people to flourish? Um, what we often find is that people often end up give up, they leave because they find their workplace cultures actually uh, squeeze them out in many different ways. So this has been great, Fernando. We can talk for hours, but we, I guess we better hand over to Richard. What do you reckon? Uh, over to you, Richard. And then people have got questions. He said lots of them are coming in. So uh, it's great to be able to talk with you, Fernando. And over Ooh. to Richard. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I'll make a brief comment and we'll certainly go to those many questions, as you say, as they've come in. Um, they've come in and interestingly in kind of a few specific, a few quite broad and some quite uh, Dundee based as well. So I think they're all relevant. So we'll look through them all. They're all very useful. Um, but just a comment for you both, really, it, it's very fascinating to hear the kind of very positive approach you have to this as well. So I'm, I'm listening out and I'm hearing things about effectively an optimum global view, how we can learn from other cultures, how through decolonizing we can effectively produce a better world. That, that's a, such a positive outlook at these times. It's, it's fascinating to see and, you know, very reassuring to hear as well. I also like that idea of concrete progress as well. And so I'm highlighting those as bullet points. But let's get to the questions because that's what the uh, audience participation has been great. Um, first off from Eleanor, I'm interested in Fiona's view that identity politics is a divide and rule strategy. Sometimes it feels like we are artificially lumped into the white people and everybody else. But the everybody else is not a homogeneous group who have experienced the same things and want to achieve the same things. How do you th think this is a common, or do you think this is a common view? And how much progress can we realistically make in decolonization while this view is still common? 
Do you know, that's a fantastic question. You know, uh, the whole issue of identity politics is um, a real conundrum because, and uh, Wendy Brown, who's an American author, talks about this and she talks about how, uh, you know, particularly liberal systems that have followed a very similar approach to anti-discrimination law, which by the way, is based on the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution. Here, you might think, well, why is she talking about US stuff? Because actually what's happened is that people have copied this framework of, um, of, uh, of, of dividing uh, people into what's called immutable categories. In other words, categories you can't change. Um, and those categories, I mean, again, rights are suffering. So uh, you could think those categories are actually quite liberating, but then they become, as actually Wendy Brown says, is like an iron cage. They they enclose us, they, 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 they entrap us. Um, but then what some people have done is said, well, let, how do we escape that? Well, we just get people to self-identify. So we've got this kind of movement towards um, you know, self-identification, uh, which creates other issues uh, because, uh, you know, if anybody self-identifies, that kind of blurs things. So I think for me, uh, you know, it's, it's it, I think we need to have some more discussion about what identity politics actually means because there's lots of policing about that, who's in and out, uh, um, uh, what, what does it mean by voice? I mean, you know, who can speak on behalf of whom? I mean, these are really, um, critical issues that we struggle with. I mean, even for example, uh, for today, like, you know, two biracial people speaking about decolonizing education. Well, we do have a voice and it's an important voice, but it is one perspective and people um, with other backgrounds will have other perspectives. Um, so I think for me, identity is actually really important. I mean, we cannot experience ourselves outside our sense of embodiment. I mean, it, this is the lived body to use the kind of phenomenological concept um but the fact is it's a complex reality it's a complex body and i must say for myself i often do wonder where i belong uh you know as somebody with a surname campbell um and i'm glad I'm, i haven't got the sri lankan surname because that automatically puts you into a kind of race class religious grid um i do often struggle with this sense of belongingness where where does one belong um i do i'm not a psychologist but i do think that we do have this idea of belonging where do we have our communities uh, maybe our communities are are very diverse i don't know whether fernando you have a response to that i mean we we are the people in between often just your microphone fernando oh sorry no i think if you want to cover it i think we, we need to pass to the next questions Okay, sure. Yeah, no, that's that certainly is well covered, and we have many questions as well. Mm -hmm. um, the the next two questions are kind of on the same theme, so I'll I'll read through them both and then invite you both to make uh, mm -hmm. comments. Um, from Sayed, the fact that most universities, especially in the South, are public and state funded, makes them more difficult to decolonize because they are under the thumbs of the neoliberal educational policies of the ministries of education of those countries. These ministries are the least interested in decolonizing the curriculum. If you agree with that, do you not think that the way to go is for like minded scholars and activists to set up private universities with a decolonized curricula? This could be done on a smaller scale where funds are limited. For example, a graduate school of social science could be set up. Um, and a similar question, are there examples of colonial institution willingly decolonizing? Can we decolonize university education? What would a decolonial university campus look like? Are we capable of evening of even imagining beyond reading lists? Um, yes, yeah, some thought provoking ideas there. So yes, where to start with uh, universities and the, if you like the framework that we find ourselves in. Can I can I can I go first? Certainly. All right. Okay. Thank you. It's such a long question, you know, and, and so many things that we need to go through. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, the idea of a public funded university, Global South, I think it's quite diverse. You know, we cannot take one country as an example because uh, if I look at, for example, my closest example in Brazil, uh, public funded universities, they have the autonomy, you know, to decide what to do with their budgets, etc. But at the same time, they need to follow kind of internet, uh, national uh, guidances and guidelines for higher education. So I think as in many countries, but uh, there is room for change. And I think that comes when you start to think about the relation between what we teach and research 
and what are the actual outcomes in society. I think you, the problem is not in the South, to be honest. The problem is the North, because the institutions in the North, they are so hegemonic that they drive, you know, the way institutions in the South are organized and structured. So what we see nowadays is not people going to the university in the South to study, to do a post-graduation, to do a PhD. It's people coming from these countries in the South to study in the North. So it's the opposite. So it's because of the, the hegemony of the, the university in the North. So I think the change should be uh, uh, in everywhere, but in first place in these hegemonic institutions. But I can give you lots of examples, you know, from uh, initiatives from social societies, uh, for civil society organizations, for example, even the organization that I work uh, with in Brazil uh, on the peripheries, uh, we are creating, you know, a curriculum and creating a different strategy uh, to create a kind of popular university in Brazil. Uh, you have the Nomad University as well, so we have many examples, you know, across the world that are trying to use a different approach. Uh, I think it should be a combination, but I think we should give more voice to social movements uh, to come together. Uh, even in Europe, you have very interesting examples. Uh, they were created during the 70s in the in, in Netherlands. It's the science shop. Uh, it's questionable the way they are, but they can be a very interesting example, for example, for European universities in terms of change, in terms of epistemological approach, etc. We don't have these in the UK. I think the only place we have is in, in Ireland in English uh, uh, universities, but these are kind of a concrete examples. I lost it, perhaps part of the, the question. I don't know if Fiona wants to complement. Yeah, the yeah, I do. Thanks, Fernando. I think you've uh, you said some great stuff there. I just firstly want to say I really want to acknowledge the participation of uh, Syed Alatas, who's asked a question. And in fact, I was quoting his father. So welcome from Malaysia there to have you with us. And uh, you've raised a great question. Um, you know, I. I think the public private, the public universities, I think it will vary from uh, country to country in terms of the um, intervention of governments uh, in the running of universities. I think it's really important to have an independent uh, university system, but we've seen the erosion of that. Even in Australia, for example, the government has been um, uh, increasingly intervening, uh, not just with funding, but in terms of policy deliberations of universities. And I think that's a bigger battle. I think we need to fight for um, uh, university independence within the, the publicly funded system. I think the private system is, again, it depends. I, I think private will give you some autonomy, but I do worry about, because as soon as you say private, then that raises issues about funding and fee structures mm -hmm. and, and, and what students have might have access to that. But I will say, and I think um, I don't really want to comment on what universities in the UK are doing better because firstly, I don't know. I'll be honest about that. But secondly, I think we need to have, I don't think there's agreement about measures. Again, this comes back to this conceptual idea about what do we mean by decolonizing? If it's a case of just changing reading lists and things like that. Um, I will say very briefly, uh, but without pointing out any particular institution. I think we have seen some examples of bad practice um, in the UK, and I think that's where the living daylights have been scared out of people. I think that's meant to be said the other way around. But I, want, I did want to put one concrete suggestion and I would need to look at it. And again, it's not picture perfect. Um, some of you might have heard of the South Asian University, which was um, set up by SARC, which is basically for, it's either four or six countries. I can't remember, sorry about that. But it's, it's in India, but it's actually been, it's run by other nations and they've come together by sharing faculty and students. And obviously the idea behind that is to, uh, give greater access for people in those countries to uh, to education, to getting a university qualification. But I think particularly, and the most contact I've had is with the sociology department. It's been about the cross fertilization of ideas. Um, I think picking up on Fernando's comments, it would be really interesting to see whether in the global north we can have a similar kind of structured arrangement um, you know, across countries um, and across some of these uh, divides and parallels to have um, uh, a universal kind of project. Finally, I just want to say the other way that we can get around this as a pragmatic level, and let's face it, with COVID budgets are pretty, pretty stretched at the moment, is to really look at ways of having a global classroom. 
you know, having a, 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 you know, to working with individuals in different countries, getting our, you know, subjects and our curriculum, getting that sorted out and opening up a space. And certainly when I was in Australia, we did that. We had people from a range of universities, a range of countries doing the same subject. So thanks for the questions. Um, yes, well, one thing about this format is, is that we can't see each other nodding, but I think many people around the world are nodding as you say that, Fiona and Fernando, that yes, that uh, that participation on a global level is something that this new environment has brought us and we can effectively harvest that. It's, it's very useful for, on this topic. Um, there's a wee note in, from Matt, from Mike in the comments, uh, about the concern about the global north, we should be careful there because there are northern indigenous peoples and I'm sure you would recognise that the decolonisation is, is not simply a, a north-south matter and we need to be careful about that. Um, so the Inuit activist movement has been highlighted there and, and that's very useful. Well, I just can I just jump in? Sure. That's, that's yep. why I said it's, it's, it, we have to stop thinking about decolonization in binary terms. We have to look at intra colonization and, you know, uh, many countries across the globe, whether in, in the so-called global north or the so-called global south, um, have horrific experiences around the treatment of um, indigenous uh, communities. Um, so we need to think laterally around these issues. So I agree with that person. OK, can I move it a little from the global position to some of the questions coming in are challenging on the Dundee position and how we should adopt that. So let, let's move there. What institutional structures does, does Dundee have in place to address decolonisation in education beyond the committee mentioned in the introduction? In other words, beyond this important individual research and teaching, what are the structures that faculty and administrators practice to invite student participation? Now, I suspect they may not uh, request an exact answer. We could list them. I'm sure Ajit could help us with that. But it, it's more the philosophy behind that question. I think that's a very fair question, but you'll both wish to respond to it. Yeah. Can I can I say, firstly, I'm probably in terms of the technical details, not the right person, but I think it's an emerging question. I think a lot of these initiatives around peripheral peoples and equalities is very much relies on the, the goodwill of staff committed. I mean, so there's individuals because of their political uh, passion and their uh, their research and teaching commitments. I think we we are doing it, uh, but it is very much dependent upon those people. So if those people go for a whole range of reasons, then um, sometimes those initiatives collapse. So I think what we need to have, and I think it was acknowledged, Richard, you acknowledged this at the outset, um, this, uh, you know, this talk and I think with the uh, Black Lives Matter, putting this stuff back on the agenda, um, you know, pushing and prodding and the university does need pushing and prodding around this, um, will hopefully get a sense of firstly a stock take of what's happening, but more in significantly to get this stuff structurally built in to the system in a systematic way. Um, so that's all I really want to say. Fernando, I don't know if you have any additional insight into this. In fact, what I have is something from the previous question, just to complement what you said. I think I'm not the expert, but uh, I think we have a horrible funding system for the universities, uh, a funding budget system that puts universities to compete against each other. So this on itself, it's already a big problem, you know, that it has to be solved to address many issues related to colonization, because uh, we cannot see, you know, students coming from abroad as just you know, a source of money. Uh, we need to see them in a different way and in the relation with, with these institutions as well. And the, at times they are just seen as you know, uh, a source of money. So I think we need to, to radicalize you know, the way the university uh, universities in general, not only Dundee, uh, see the problem by pushing you know, different government agendas for funding because the way it is, I think it's terrible and puts universities and colleagues against each other in a very competitive environment. This is not healthy. Um, I'll just take the direction even more specific, but I, I think one of the correspondents has, has made a very interesting point. Um, so I'll read it as it stands. Um, from Shona, I was interested to hear Fernando's thoughts on colonialism and international students studying here. I often sense of unrest at the university's need for overseas students. In my school, dental, the students pay personally for or by government a huge sum to study at the best places. 
while we enjoy the opportunity to meet with other cultures and learn from each other, I worry that we are simply continuing the exploitation of perpetual colonialism. Can you expand on how we might reverse this without losing the real social benefits of meeting and knowing people from other places? Well, as I was saying, uh, we need to look at the funding system. You know, this is very complicated. I think, uh, again, look at the example of my country. I can tell you guys, uh, in my country, anyone who teaches in a master's program has to have a PhD, has to have publication and research. This is not the reality in Dundee. So how can you say you have international high profile programs when you have different kind of standards, you know? And again, it goes to the, that very colonialist uh, question about who sets the standards, who tells, you know, what is world class or excellence. And I think when students come from abroad, of course, they look at a different sort of experience, not only in terms of education, but also cultural, which is good. But at the same time, they're looking fundamentally in a kind of symbolic value that, you know, a certificate from a UK a dominant institution has when they go back to their country because it's certain they'll get a good job. So it's a kind of economy of exchange, you know, when you, you come here uh, in search of something that is beneficial to you individually as well. I think the key problems in terms of the funding system that is pushing this kind of dynamics when students and partnerships are seen much more in, in terms of money rather than anything else. I'm not saying that money is not important because at the end that's what pay our salaries, you know, and that's what sustain uh, the universe as an institution, etc. But we need to get a balance. That's very important because it's almost a kind of a ethical perspective, you know, in the way we do. Yeah, can I can I just add to that? I think, um, you know, I think we can be uh, more proactive. You know, the Equalities Act, for example, has a section in it. This is the UK uh, 2010 Equalities Act for the overseas folk here today, uh, it, it has a provision for positive action. So we have this issue of underrepresentation. We know it's not going to sort itself out. So we actually have to need, we have to be proactive about redressing the legacies of the imbalance, imbalances and asymmetrical relationships. Um, in my previous university, and this was um, for international students, but it was at the PhD level. So that's the, the caveat. Uh, we offered actually a program for uh, fee relief, like in fact, actually we did a fee waiver um, and it was for overseas students. It was competitive. But what I was able to do uh, with that in, in the school that I was in was um, attract applications, not just from people in global south countries, but people from marginalised backgrounds, you know, people who would have been locked out of the elite universities or weren't part of the elites in their own country. So that was one way that um, I was able to firstly get those experiences and the point that the person who was asking the question was about exposure and sharing the knowledge, but also, you know, really redressing those issues of elitism and um, social exclusion. And that was really successful because what it meant was that people who were marginalised in their own countries were able to take back that knowledge uh, and, and prestige because I had a PhD, obviously, uh, and to their countries and, and work on social development. So it very much fits in with the sustainable development goals. So I think um, that's one way that we can partner with universities, the kinds of partnerships to get around this idea of international students just being merely seen as cash cows. Thank you. Yeah, I felt that that question was very relevant to my time as an academic as well, where I certainly uh, experienced that and felt that the richness that international students bring to the university is is magic in many ways. Uh, a specific question here that neither of you may be able to answer, but it's certainly fair to, to highlight it. I wonder where Dundee University is in terms of its links with the slave trade historically, just reflecting on the ways that Glasgow University has been quite explicit about its historical links that the institution had. Now, you may or may not either of you have knowledge of that. And no, I, my knowledge is is fairly minimal. Um, I, I I wouldn't want to talk about it. I, I know there has been some research. I don't know what critical conversations have happened at the community level uh, among BAME people in Dundee yeah. who maybe are part of that legacy. I, I um, Maybe Richard, you might know a little bit more about it. I do know more that in the sense that we have looked at it and certainly we're not to the extent of Glasgow University in the way that the Jute Barons benefited from the uh, the slave trade. But there is undoubtedly, as you say, Fiona, a, a factor in an area that should be explored and examined. 
Um, so yes, well, I think probably best to respond to that in a formal manner offline. Yeah, just just to complement uh, Richard, uh, I think uh, even if you look at, for example, the Baxter family who supported you know, the creation of the University of Dundee, of course, they were a very well family in an in a, in a age of, you know, very precarious working conditions, etc. So if we really investigate these things, I never done, possibly we're going to find some, something that is very complicated. So I think it's important for the diverse, you know, to, to clarify on these things because at the end they are the, the funders in some ways. Sure. And, sure. And can I can I just add it's not just about the slave trade. There has been more work done, for example, about the colonial legacies of medicine and some of the kind of health and medical uh, kind of relations, particularly that uh, both India and Sri Lanka, formerly known as Ceylon, were known as uh, model, model colonies. So I think there has been some work done around medical histories. Yeah, I think, um, another question for Fernando. Uh, white privilege is only a theory. However, so who decides that this is what we should orientate the curriculum towards? What about the people of colour who do not agree with Macintosh or D'Angelo? Would they also have a platform to articulate their beliefs, which might not be the West liberal tradition? Is it not more that we actually shouldn't underpin our education with one theory or ideology? Absolutely. I think, you know, uh, first, uh, this is a complex question, but uh, I think I, I go with Fiona when she says about accommodating different viewpoints. We need to be more open to debates. But we need to challenge it and certain positions. We need to say no, this is not acceptable. I think that's the starting point for some conversations. Uh, it's, it's, I'm not going to respond here uh, in detail, but uh, I think there is room uh, to debate. And I think we need to have this open conversation across the universe to know about the theoretical positioning. Uh, when I refer you know, to some authors, I'm not imposing perspectives. What I'm saying is that there is some kind of a debate around what is called white privilege. And you need to acknowledge that, you know, because some people don't believe this exists. And I think it's complicated. So we need to reflect critically about these things. Uh, I, I'm certain that Fiona has also things to add about that, that question. Yeah, actually I do. I mean, I deliberately unconsciously decided not to use that phraseology. I think it's um, I think there are some dominant perspectives and I think uh, viewpoint diversity is really important. But, you know, I'll be honest and, uh, you know, this is not about upset or anything like that. When someone says to me, there's no such thing as white privilege, I do have a visceral reaction, you know, from the day my daughter's 19 at the moment and, uh, and she looks Asian, you know, if you look at appearance, not that appearance should make a difference, but it does. Um, and the fact is from really, really early age, uh, you know, she's she's had the experiences of uh, of racial taunts and uh, but why, but also people making presumptions uh, how they live their lives um, is, is different from ours. So I think uh, my, my concern and I've raised this earlier viewpoint diversity, but I think there's kind of and, and I think it's not about people's intentions. I think most people are of goodwill, but we have a very antagonistic and hostile environment at the moment. There's a, a battle over cultures, a battle over ideas. We must have conversations. We need to learn that, that lovely art of dialogue, you know, to and, and in a peaceful, calm way. Um, doesn't mean it can't be passionate, uh, but we do need to look at the fact that there are uh, asymmetrical relationships based on um, on colour. And even if we view the idea of colour and race as a fiction, uh, they have been uh, mobilised. But uh, I do think we have to, uh, what I am worried about, and, uh, and that's why I chose not to use white privilege in my talk, is it has become a very weaponised, uh, you know, a very singular perspective. So I think we need to open up the territory and uh, reflect, but also have a range of approaches. Okay. Compliments, Fiona, just quickly. Uh, I agree with you, but uh, I think we need to acknowledge that there are some systems of privilege, including, you know, being white or not. Uh, but uh, I think it, these kind of uncomfortable conversations has to have place and we need to create a space for that. So when I said about you know, having space to talk about racism and discrimination and white privilege, that's the point. So we need to create a space at universe to talk about these things openly, because what happens is that uh, people keep talking to their peers and they don't have the opportunity to be challenged and to reflect critically about what's going on. So we need to create this space definitively. 
Uh, thank you. Well, well, we're moving to the time to wrap things up, but just before we do that, uh, well, I'll explore one final area with you. But I just noticed that within the questions and the comments that uh, our correspondents have very managed to answer themselves often as well. So there's, there's a hearty conversation occurring within the comments, which is excellent. Uh, and there have been areas that we haven't touched on, and, and I guess we have to accept that. It's now got almost beyond my ability to follow and manage it. So that's a very good sign, I think. Um, but just one thing we, that we should finish with, there was quite a bit of interest in the proposal of something concrete like a module that all students would study and all staff would study. Um, that's been seen as a very positive idea. Do you wish or can either of you expand on that kind of approach an education approach to this? Yeah, well, I, I would like to say, I mean, I guess it's, uh, you know, there's nothing invented from my perspective. I think it's the kind of like the US style liberal arts kind of base foundational education thing. I, I do think, uh, you know, it's, it's a signature experience. It shows we're serious. But it's really about, uh, it's about different knowledge systems. So you can actually, um, you know, you you can you can take the identity politics out of it. It's about exposure to different global knowledge systems and focusing on again that kind of rooting it in that idea of coexistence uh, and harmony to use a, a Confucian idea. Um, about what makes brings people together to flourish, but also so that all students can can look at their teaching and professional and research practices in terms of uh, dehumanizing practices. So I think that's something valid. It's one module, you know. Uh, I mean, you see, the the devil will be in the detail about whether people get credit for it or not, but I do think it should be compulsory, um, and I think it would be uh, powerfully symbolic, but uh, very powerful, hopefully, in its uh, pedagogy. And Fernando, I, I feel that you're going to say we need to experience this more than just the education, but it, it's kind of it's a lived experience. Yeah, in a wider sense, you know, we need to create a channels, you know, with communities outside the university uh, to accommodate these different viewpoints, not only academically, but, you know, beyond academia. That's very important. I think that's the point where you need to create some sort of a community uh, unity or, or anything that can uh, make the bridge that we don't have a well established right now. We have here and there several bridges actually you know, across the universe, several activities going on, but we do need something more centralized, would say, you know, that can be more embedded in the curriculum. Uh, I should give you both a chance in case things have come up in the questions uh, that you feel you've wished to respond to, but if not, I can uh, summarise very shortly. But anything from both of you before I do that? Um, I just, can I just say there was a question and I will respond to the person offline, but it was about different forms of argumentation. I think it's really important as part of this decolonising process that people be exposed to, you know, these really rich thousand year old traditions. And somebody asked me about um, different forms of um, Indian reasoning. I don't know whether you can see this, but uh, there's a, I'm holding a book up here and I better look at it. It's called Identity as Reasons Choice. It's by um, J Jonathan Ganeri. I'll put it in the in the question thing, but it looks at actually the idea of public reason from the Indian tradition. So, I mean, this stuff basically, you know, not only is this good politics, this is about enrichment. So decolonization is about enrichment to hear about different lives and to hear about different knowledge systems. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for that. that. And that did come across Fiona, so we can see that clearly. So yes, I'll clearly thank our conversationalists, Fiona and Fernando. Um, very positive in the approach and really at these sort of times it's so easy to dwell on the worst of cultures but you both picked up that we need to learn about the best of cultures and build a global approach that develops on that and, and it's very much a positive optimum world view so people will be uh, very reassured by that. Um, but I can thank the audience as well who've actively participated through the the question approach and it's, as I say it's turned into an answer and a discussion and uh, kind of further points approach as well. So that's been excellent. Um, I should thank to the people behind the scenes who've been making the system work. So that's the University External Relations team and John Urch leads that and is the representative for those people and it's gone very well. So thanks to that group. Um, I, I noticed that, you know, a few things were sort of standing out for me that ideas that we make concrete progress, that, that's a definite um, purposeful element that we need to build on. The breaking of bubbles and people not in silos, I, I appreciate that and that's a, again another another uh, kind of thought process that we need. 
it came through in the comments that learning about the diversity of others and the fact that we have international students is such a strength for the University of Dundee. We have to optimise that. So it will be exciting to build on that. And we, I do think we have the mechanisms to do that. We picked up on that proposal of a, of a globalisation type module and understanding of decolonisation and the context of other cultures and the richness of those cultures. Um, that's incredibly worthwhile. And recognising too that little note about our hiring practices and what's got us into this position that we've not got um, particularly good equality or diversity approaches and we'd be so much richer if we achieved that. So we'll close there. Um, I have an opportunity to highlight the next public event in the Black History Month. So that's the lived experience of African black academics in higher education. It's on Eventbrite. Uh, it features Dr. Demismo Moyo and Dr. Vincent Onyango, and it's hosted by Professor Faisal Khan. It's Thursday the 29th of October at 4 p.m. UK time. So you can follow through on that. And that's, of course, as I say, on Eventbrite and on the university web pages. So thank you to everybody. Uh, yes, the conversationalists, but the way this has gone, it's kind of everyone has been involved. So that's been a, a, a great experience. Thank you all.